Okay, Dr. Steve. Dr. Steve is here with us. I mean, we are a global initiative for expert manual therapist. I'm TJ and I have Dr. Steve with me. We are the co-founders of GEM. And uh, anything you want to say, Dr. Steve, before we start? We still see people joining in. This could be a one day lecture. I mean, when I started doing research on making this presentation, I think I, I, I felt like I could make, I could teach this for eight hours because there's so much new and cool stuff coming out. And this seems a very simple diagnosis, simple treatment. But when you look at the research in the last 10, 15, 20 years, the research, research tells us to practice very differently the way we've been practicing for years. So and that's why it's it's fun to fun to teach these evidence-based programs because I mean it definitely definitely gives you ideas about how you can how how you can improve as a therapist anything you want to say dr steve yeah there's a lot actually so it's amazing how much has changed just since uh we went to physiotherapy school right dr singh i mean that's it's starting to get further and further back every year but i graduated from a dpt program in texas in 2013 and i would have to say that what i learned at that time was largely useless and ineffective. And I don't do anything. I don't do any of the things really that I learned about lateral epicondylalgia when I was in physiotherapy school. You know, I think we talked briefly about the possibility of differential diagnosis, but what people didn't tell you is that probably in 75% or more of the cases where I have lateral elbow pain, radial nerve, um is the primary symptom generator um versus like uh tennis elbow tendons and stuff like that and um and, and in the other in the other instances where you have a true tennis elbow and we've got like a tendonitis or epicondylalgia <clears throat> um radial nerve will also be involved in that in those situations and so I think as physical therapists, it's really easy to put on blinders and to say, this is the diagnosis or this is the diagnosis. But so much of the time, we have multiple things together, right? We have pain in a part of the body. It's very common that the nerves in the area will become unhappy. Or sometimes the main problem is at the level of the spine. And it looks like we're having lateral elbow pain or knee pain. Um, whereas the primary problem is actually in the spine itself. And it's so common. And it's one of the things that differentiates, you know, I think a really good clinician and a very basic clinician. Right now, I am uh, floating at different clinics all over Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, they're workers' compensation clinics. So if a worker gets injured, they'll go to one of these clinics, see the doctor, get an x-ray, start physiotherapy. And so it's extremely acute injuries. And it's so funny because with my training, with my time at GEM, with specialization, with fellowship, the materials that we're teaching today and that we teach in our curriculum, with that knowledge and skill set, you know, at, in my pocket, everywhere I go, clinicians are asking me, oh, I have this difficult patient. What do you think about this patient? oh, I, I really want you to see this guy because I've been working with him for a few sessions and symptoms are not changing because they see that every time I touch a patient, my treatment is different and my treatment is effective. Like so much of the time. Um, there's, vi there's very few patients where I walk into the clinic and I say, oh, look, this is what the physical therapist was doing. Let me do these same things. Never, like never. And half of the time, more than half of the time, what physiotherapist is doing is not even um, is not even like what should be done. Like I, I like I'm like a personal trainer that graduated high school would be doing these things. I said this person has a doctorate in physiotherapy. 
how are they acting like a personal trainer? And I get it. So when I was a new physiotherapist, there was so much that I was still learning and uncomfortable with and unfamiliar with. But, you know, the reason you guys are here today, that spark of interest, the spark of curiosity, the hunger to learn, that's what ultimately drives therapists to become better, to become great, to become effective, to become successful, that hunger. And so for you guys to be here, we're so glad that you guys are hungry, that you guys are interested. Um, hopefully you'll learn a lot in this lecture. This is an incredibly common diagnosis that's commonly treated the wrong way. And so we want to show you guys how to effectively treat this because um, sometimes it's you know, sometimes it's not what you think it is, or sometimes there's other things that are driving the symptoms in this area. What are the different things that can put pain here? And how do we treat those? And it's amazing because the research is there. The research says you need to manipulate C5, C6. You need to manipulate radial head. You need to manipulate the proximal row of the wrist. The research is there. Neurodynamics. We need to do some neurodynamics if there's radial nerve involvement. It takes two seconds. It takes two seconds to determine if radial nerve is involved in this person's pain. Literally put them in a position, move their head and ask about symptoms. If they have symptoms, then you just move something far away from the elbow and we find out is there neural tension or not. So this is not difficult. It's just not familiar to a lot of people. So we're just gonna jump in. Okay. So I'm going to give you a little background of how, how these concepts have evolved. So just a little background. And whenever we talk about, so if you guys, if you guys noticed our presentation is not lateral epicondylitis, it's lateral epicondylysia. The difference is, I mean, there was a landmark research done by Dr. Khan, Dr. Kareem Khan, he's from Canada, very, very interesting man. So he says that epicondylitis is an outdated term. Okay. He wrote a piece in New England Journal of Medicine where he talks about time to abandon the tendinitis myth, which means that they did research and they were trying to find why all the inflammatory treatments like NSAIDs and all the laser and cryotherapy and stuff like that is not helping the patients with tendinitis. So they found that it's actually not tendinitis. This is actually right from that article. So they basically what they did was they did light microscopy here and they found that the collagen fibers were separated, thin, fragile, and disrupted. And there was a lot of, there were a lot of Tenocytes. Tenocytes are the cells that are trying to help tendons repair. So the idea is that epicondylitis is not actually true itis because there are no active inflammatory cells. So classic inflammatory cells are usually present or actually we should say. Yep. Yeah. So these are the changes he found histological changes he found. So what was happening was because of the repetitive trauma, the tendons are going through this change. Tendons are going through this change where there is a type one collagen breakdown. There's a state of disrepair. And because this area is very vascular and neural, there is a irritation of that tissue. Okay. And the tissue is not repaired are not getting repaired because of repetitive trauma and the outer layer of the tendon is also getting impacted. Peritoneum is getting impacted, endotinon is getting impacted and then it leads to the rupture of the tendon. So the point is the research of Dr. Kareem Khan tells us that all the anti-inflammatory modalities we have been using are redundant because this is not a true inflammatory process rather than rather it's a degenerative process of the tendon and that's why 
we don't call it tendonitis. And it's the same thing with your rotator cuff or your Achilles tendonitis. It's not a true, true tendonitis. Okay. Okay. So this is an, another research, interesting research given very, very recently, like three years ago, which talks about a term called as tendinosis, which is different from tendinitis, which means that what happens is there is mechanical trauma on the tendon leading to alteration in the tissue, which Dr. Khan also said, if you go back to the previous slide, he also said that your tendon is getting thin and frayed because of abrupt forces on the tendon, okay? Okay. And that is causing an angiofibroblastic degeneration, which means that your blood vessels are getting affected, your fibroblastic proliferation is happening, which is trying to repair the tissue, which is trying to repair the tissue, leading to, sometimes leading to a structural failure, leading to fibrosis and calcification. And these are not the stages of inflammation, if you guys know. These are not the stages of inflammation. This, these are the stages of degeneration. Okay. So tendon is going through this degenerative process. Tendon is going through this degenerative process and getting affected because of abrupt mechanical trauma on the tissue. Okay. And we have to understand why this abrupt mechanical trauma is happening. And we'll explain that. Okay. There are the six stages or six or seven phases given as a classification or depending on the duration of symptoms. Okay. Phase one is mild pain after activity. Patient usually recovers within 24 hours. Type two is or phase two is 48 to 72 hours. Okay. And if the mild pain stays before the activity, that is phase three. Okay. And then you have five, six, seven is consistent pain and it is affecting your ADLs, your activities of daily living. Okay. So the idea is we have to change our mindset from treating it as an active inflammatory pathology to a degenerative process. And we have to understand why this tissue is going through a degenerative process. Why this tissue has, why this tissue has a reason to go through this degenerative process. Okay. Okay. This is another very complex slide and I'm, I'm trying to, I'll try to dumb it down. So the idea is Dr. Steve was telling us that 75% of the times he sees it as a radial pathology rather than a tendon pathology. Okay. So there is definitely a neurogenic component to this condition. Whenever you have, when you, whenever you have a nerve involvement, you know that your radial nerve comes from here, divides into a posterior interosseous nerves, which gets entrapped sometimes under your supinator muscle. Okay. Usually you have increased reactivity to neuropeptides, which means that whenever you have a neural involvement, you have accumulation of neuropeptides there, which can give you symptoms of pain, itching, irritation. Okay. What happens is that we end up treating, we end up treating it with steroid or NSAIDs, and that inhibits the expression of CGRP, which, which I'm going to try to explain this and dump it down. This is a little complex. So, what happens is whenever you have a, whenever you have a wound healing process going on, when you're trying to heal a wound, you need the expression of calcitonin gene-related peptide. Okay. You need this expression so that it can kick in and help close the wound or help complete the healing process. But if you get an injection or you start taking NSAIDs, the expression is inhibited. So you're getting this, you're getting this degenerative process and you have inhibition of CGRP. So basically this cascade is not helping 
the stuff to heal. Okay. Since it's, it's, I think, a little complex, but okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about what evidence we have. Interestingly, if you look at this piece of research, you don't have any level A evidence for as far as, as, far as interventions are concerned. I'm going to talk about, and I'll share this on the group. So this was published by JSPT, orthopedic section of APTA last year in 2022. And I'm going to talk about the summary of the guidelines. When you talk about self-reported measures, you had like level A evidence. So if you're if a patient comes to you with elbow pain and you give them a dash questionnaire that has a level A evidence. Talking about interventions, therapeutic exercise has level B evidence. Not surprisingly, multimodal interventions has level B evidence, therapeutic exercise. Manual therapy, mobilization, manipulation has level B evidence. And that's the best evidence available. There is no systemic review available for tennis elbow, which was accepted in the CPG. Okay. Soft tissue mob mobilization has level C evidence. Dry needling has level B evidence. Taping has level B evidence, but taping has only evidence for short-term short -term relief. Okay. All the stuff we like to use, cryotherapy, laser, phonophoresis, tens, ion interferences has level C evidence. So not very good evidence. The best treatment of choice if you're trying to treat patients with tennis elbow is therapeutic exercise, multimodal interventions, your therapeutic exercise plus manual therapy. Manual therapy, mobilizations, manipulations has level B evidence. Okay. Dry needling has level B evidence as well. So in, taping has level B evidence for short-term relief. Okay. And I mean, cryotherapy, laser, phonophoresis, tens, and antifreeze has poor evidence, but level C evidence. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about the diagnosis and differential diagnosis because with our basic education, we if we have a tennis elbow problem, what we do is give patients eccentric exercises, maybe do a little soft tissue here. Okay, that's that's what we do. So, but lateral elbow pain can have a lot of causes. So the common two muscles that are involved are usually. ECRB and ECRL. Okay. Can anybody tell me why ECRB is more involved than ECRL? Anybody? Why ECRB is more prone to get involved and why it's the most common muscle? Going back to your basic education. So that why ECRB is more involved than ECRL? Anybody? Are you guys awake? Anybody who can tell me why ECRB is involved, more involved than ECRL? Anybody? Short moment arm, liver. More stress. Okay. We'll tr I'll try to answer this question as we go along. Think about it, why ECRB is more involved than ECRL, and think about the origin and insertion of the muscle. Think about where it's coming from, where, is it, where it is inserting. I think Dr. Steve answered it when he was in the, in the introduction. I think he actually answered it. So we'll talk about this, okay? So another structures that can get involved is your posterior cutaneous nerve of the forearm, which is a branch of radial nerve, okay? Your joint dysfunction of the radio ulnar joint can get, can, can be a cause of lateral elbow pain. Your joint dysfunction of your proximal radiohumeral joint, which is this, can also be a cause. ANTT of lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm. Can anybody tell me what is the, What is lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm? Where does it where, where does it come from? What is the primary nerve? 
You guys know your anatomy? Anybody? You guys know your anatomy. Where does the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm comes from? Anybody? Are you guys awake? You guys need to know your anatomy. I mean, this is important. Musculocutaneous, good. Yeah. Your C5, C6, C7, C6, C7 joint dysfunction can also affect it. Your C5, C6, C6, C7 nerve root dysfunction can give you pain there. And as Dr. Steve was saying, rightly saying, so your scaphole unit joint can also give you symptoms in the lateral elbow. So you have all these possible underlying diagnoses, right? And as Dr. Steve said, you can also have various combinations of these diagnoses. You can have a ECRB involvement and a posterior cutaneous nerve involvement. You can have an ECRB involvement and a radial nerve involvement. You can have an ECRB involvement and a C5, C6 involvement. If all we're going to do is just do wrist extension, eccentric, concentric, and rub that area, it's not going to fix the, it's not going to fix C5, C6. It's not going to fix it's not going to fix the radial nerve. If all we're going to do is just do a little soft tissue here, give us eccentric exercises, right? The idea is that you should be able to assess lateral elbow pain along the chain up till C5, C6. You should be able to assess the proximal row of the corpus. You should be able to assess the radio humeral joint, you should be able to assess the superior radial nerve joint, you should be able to assess the radial nerve, you should be able to assess the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm. And there are some possible mechanisms that are causing these cascade cascade of problems. I think I'm getting an interesting question. Okay. So manual therapy is a lie. A line of treatment. I said when you go back to the CPG, the level A level A evidence is a systemic review, right? For tennis elbow or lateral epicondylgia, we don't have level A evidence. Level A evidence is systemic review. Level B evidence is randomized control trial. Whenever we are looking at evidence and research, we are always looking at level A or level B evidence. Those are the preferred evidence we are looking for. Okay. Okay. Level C is a case series and then level D is like a case report and level E is expert opinion. So whenever we are looking for like gold standard research, we are looking for level A and level B. That gives us idea that this is the evidence is there. When you look at this clinical prediction guideline, sadly, there is no high quality systemic review available. So the best evidence for interventions is level B for tennis elbow in the CPG. Okay. And multimodal treatments like therapy exercise plus manual therapy also has level B evidence. Okay. Manu manual therapy mobilization manipulation has level B evidence. Soft tissue work has level C evidence as per the CPG. Taping has level B evidence, but only for like short-term relief. So man, the best evidence we have is for manual therapy and therapeutic exercise. But the problem is that what is included in manual therapy? Manual therapy is mobilization and manipulations. That's what is included in manual therapy. I'll share that CPG on the group. Or you can always go on APTA website. They publish the CPGs. Usually you can access it for free. And if you if you if you're not able to access it, I'll share it on the group. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about the muscles that usually gets involved in the dorsolateral forearm. You have brachioradialis, inconius. As I told you, ECRB is most commonly involved. Then ECRL is also involved, extensor digitorum. You have digiti minimi and carpe carpe ulnaris. Okay. Yeah. If you look at the article by Bissett 2015, he talks about the risk factors being 
workers in manual occupations, people who do repetitive work. And that is, you have to think from the standpoint, what will cause degeneration? So these are all the factors that usually cause degeneration of the tendon, a lot of office work, old age. Being a female was found to be a risk factor, probably because of a lot of arm use or housework. Previous tobacco use, concurrent rotator cuff pathology. Yeah. So you have a shoulder problem that affects the mechanics of your, maybe mechanics of your upper back, thoracic spine, C5, C6, C6, C7, C7. You lower cervical upper thoracic and that can cause, increase the risk of having lateral elbow pain in future. Yeah. And I think these are the interesting mechanisms, I think, which I found. And I think that gives you an idea how, how you can correlate lateral elbow pain with different different body segments, different other diagnoses, different biomechanical problems. So Dr. Steve gave me this idea of gave this us idea of C5, C6 problem causing pain at the elbow. So there's an article by Vincent Zeno. Vincent Zeno is also he's done tons of research on lateral elbow pain. And C5, C6 dermatomal involvement can cause pain at the elbow. Okay. So whenever you're treating lateral elbow pain, definitely test C5, C6, C6, C7. I think enough evidence out there. I think there is, there is an article published by Cleveland 2004, also talks about C5, C6, C6, C7 being involved and giving pain at the elbow. Yeah. So definitely a good piece of evidence. So every time you treat treat the elbow pain, make sure you assess the neck. Okay. Talking about thoracic spine and rib cage, and this is actually very recent research, and we were talking about lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm causing symptoms in the lateral elbow. If you have upper rib dysfunction, third, fourth rib dysfunction, it can increase the tension in pectoralis minor muscle can cause downward rotation of the can cause downward rotation of the scapula cause anterior humeral translation and then it can it can impact the musculocutaneous nerve okay and if your musculocutaneous nerve is impacted it can cause it can entrap the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm giving you lateral elbow pain so the point is you can have a rib dysfunction and you can have lateral elbow pain through this cascade of problems. And all you do is just rub the, rub the elbow or do eccentric exercises. You're not fixing, fixing the problem because you're not even treating where the, where the source is. The source is third and fourth rib, your pectoralis minor, affected mechanics of the cervical thoracic spine, okay? Affected mechanics of the humerus, affected increased tension on the lateral cord. Okay, so this is a very important and interesting neurophysiological mechanism where everything in the rib cage is giving you symptoms in the elbow. Okay, so the idea is assess, treat the cervical thoracic spine, treat C5, C6. Okay, okay. Another very common biomechanical me mechanism is the very, very simple. You have a radial head translation. Usually, I think this is a, also research done by back in the day by Mulligan. And they, he also has a manual therapy technique for it. I think Vincent Zeno also says the same thing. You have a radial head dysfunction. Your radial head is sitting dorsolaterally. And it is causing supinator hypertonicity and involvement of posterior interosseous radial nerve. Yeah. Make sure that you treat the underlying joint dysfunction if you're trying to address the radial nerve. Okay. And all you do is soft tissue work on the soft tissue work on the lateral elbow. It's not going to fix the problem because you have underlying joint dysfunction here. Dorsolateral translation. We'll show you the manipulation technique. Okay. okay. Another one was which Dr. Steve was mentioning to us, proximal row of corpals. So if your wrist has 70 or 80 degrees of extension, okay, 50% of extension comes from the proximal row and the distal row, okay? 
And I think I think there's a study by Kaufman which talks about scaphoid contributes to 92% of mobility and extension. So if scaphoid is sitting in dysfunction, you're going to have loss of extension. When you have loss of extension, you're going to have biomechanical inefficiency of ECRB. Look at the mechanics, look at the anatomy where it sits. Okay. So biomechanical inefficiency of ECRB will lead to increased microtrauma, thus causing degenerative process. Okay. So the point is, you, you have to assess the scaphoid unit joint. And if it's dorsally displaced, if your scaphoid is tended to palpation, you have only have 40 degrees of extension, you can never fix this patient unless you fix the underlying cause, right? You fix the, you improve the biomechanical efficiency of ECRB, then your degen, you can break, you can, you can change that degenerative process that is going on. Yeah. Okay. So coming back to the assessment, check the elbow, wrist, forearm range of motion. Usually you have restricted wrist extension. That is a strong indicator of tennis elbow. If one side wrist extension is 80, another side wrist extension is 40, just working on the elbow will not help. Make sure that you treat that scapula unit joint. Okay. You can do the stress testing of medial and lateral collateral elbow ligaments. Okay. If you have a history of LCL tear, it will cause instability on the lateral aspect, causing increased tension on the lateral aspect, maybe causing entrapment of the radial or posterior interosseous nerve. Okay. So make sure you check for the elbow instability. Okay. Definitely check for cervical thoracic spine. Okay. Check for C5, C6 mobility, third and fourth ribs springing, neurodynamic evaluation of radial nerve. You check the ANT, and that, that's what Dr. Steve was saying. Check the radial nerve, check the posterior interosseous. Okay. And the point is that your patient may have everything on the list. Okay. So if your patient has everything on the list, you treat everything on the list, which means that you improve the radial ex wrist extension, you improve the stability of the elbow. You treat the cervical thoracic spine, you treat third and fourth rib, you treat the radial nerve, you treat the posterior interosseous nerve. And you'll see patients like that who have who have history of three, four, three or four previous episodes of tennis elbow and other things starts to get involved. Okay. And we see this all the time. The point is that if you miss one or miss two of the four or five possible causes, the symptoms will keep coming back. Okay. If you just keep treating the wrist and elbow and you don't treat the cervical thoracic, you're not fixing the, the root cause, right? Okay, these are some of the some of the tests for the tendons. You can palpate the lateral epicondyle. You can do a resisted wrist extension. You can do a resisted finger extension. Okay. Okay. This is a moving valgus stress for MCL test, MCL, MCL test. I mean, if you're trying to detect the MCL tear, usually your patients will present with medial elbow pain between 120 to, 120 to 70 degrees of elbow flexion. Yeah. A lot of people who have history of MCL tear can have lateral, a lot of lateral elbow pain. We see in patients who are pitchers, baseball pitchers, they have history of MCL injury or surgery, and they start to demonstrate lateral elbow problems. So if you have positive moving, moving valgus stress test, which means you're presenting with elbow instability, it can give you symptoms on the lateral aspect of the elbow. Yeah. You can also do valgus and varus stress test in 20 to 30 degrees of elbow flexion. Okay. If you if patient reports pain and excessive laxity, laxity okay, you definitely have an unstable elbow. Okay. So this is a kind of a very important slide. Next time when you see a patient with tennis elbow or lateral, lateral elbow pain, these are all the things you should check. 
you definitely should check for scaphoid and new net mobility. Should definitely check for superior inferior radial nerve joint. And superior primarily, but also check for inferior radial nerve joint. You should also check for segmental mobility of ulnohumeral mobility and radiohumeral mobility. So check whether the medial aspect of the elbow or lateral aspect of the elbow is involved. Patient has complete range of motion, inflection, extension, supination, supination, pronation. Check C5, C6, C6, C7. Okay. Check upper thoracic spine and check the rib cage. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. You're checking these seven things. Okay. When more often than not, you will find at least three or four being involved. Dr. Steve, what do you think? Do you think these things occur? <laughs> these problems, you see these problems in isolation or you see them? I think, are you, are you muted? There we go. There we go. Sorry, I was just waiting to be unmuted. Um, <clears throat> so it's so funny because there's, I don't have a short answer for anything. You asked if we see, you know, some of these things in isolation. And I think one of the things that makes, takes you from being a, you know, a good PT to a great PT is your ability to understand the regional interdependence. And so, you know, lateral elbow is just like carpal tunnel is just like, um, pain in the bottom of the foot, you know, there's so many different things that cause and contribute these different things that you have to check. I call it, it's not just a kinetic chain. I call it the neurokinetic chain because we're talking about biomechanics, but we're also talking about the neural interconnectedness of the body, right? If we're looking at the bottom of the foot, we're interested in S1, S2. If we're looking at the lateral elbow, you should be interested in C5, C6, and not only C5, C6, um, but what other um, things in the area contribute to what happens at C5, C6. You know, C5, C6 is part of the neck, and so the upper neck contributes to the lower neck. The C5, C6 is part of the lower neck, while the upper back and ribs contribute to what happened at the base of the neck. The scalene muscles, you know, first rib, you know, if you've got neural tension, if you have neural tension, let's say that you find that, yes, there is nerve involvement in my patient's arm. Um, now, all of a sudden, we have to follow that nerve all the way up into the neck. And along that nerve's course is the what is the thoracic outlet. Scalenes, first and second, uh, first and second rib. Um, the clavicle, does the clavicle sit too low because the shoulder girdle is depressed? Is there an anterior humeral head that can put compression on the neurovascular bundle? Is pec major, pec minor, are they hypertonic? Are they putting extra pressure on the neurovascular bundle? Um, there's just, there's so many things. And so at some point you can go one of two ways. You can either assess the local problem and start treating the local problem. And then after a session or two of treating the elbow, at that point, you would then check the neurokinetic chain where you would go up and check the shoulder, the thoracic spine, the ribs, the neck. That's not wrong, um, but it's by far my preference and my practice that I always go proximal first. Like I always, I want to know if there's an issue with the nerve at the neck and the, the hose pipe is kinked, right? Something is impeding neurological, the, 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 the flow of oxygen and blood down the nerve to the elbow that we're treating. If there's a problem higher up in the neurokinetic chain, I want to treat that first. I want to treat that on day one. And it's so interesting because a lot of times um, you know, we'll go to the spine, we'll treat the spine, we'll treat proximally. And you might not know what's going on there, but as soon as you start poking around, in this case, C5, C6, first rib, scalenes, um, the neck, you know, as soon as you start just assessing the part of the neck where this nerve comes out, you start finding, you start finding stuff and you're like, oh, it's tender there. Oh, it is. It's stiff there. That's so interesting. And, and you start to see these patterns 
it's like it's like the mold just breaks and the fog lifts and now you just see things and because you know to look for it you see it so much faster so much more you know like i have physical therapy students and it's tough because they cannot follow because of how they how we learn to be pts is different than how we need to be pts and so other physical therapists and students if they're just watching me, they cannot follow my train of thought, our train of thought, because it's so different. But then when the patient gets better in like one session or two sessions and the patient's crying and having a very emotional moment because they someone has touched their pain, um, it's just, it's, it's really eye-opening. And I remember being, a, I remember... Uh, working with a therapist, Dr. Singh and Dr. this other uh, PT named Dr. Wilson um, at Integrity uh, early on. And I would watch patients have these moments as a new PT. And I'm watching these therapists, Dr. Singh and Dr. Wilson. And I'm just like, I would not even have thought to go there. I can't even do that manipulation. I don't, under I don't understand how I have a doctorate of physical therapy and I don't have that skill set, that knowledge, that mentality. And that's what lit the fire in me to make me want to pursue additional education, right? Let's go to specialization. Let's go to fellowship. And then I worked with Dr. Singh for some time. And we did same fellowship program together. And then he went on and did another fellowship. And um, and so, yeah, it's 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 radically different. So So I think circling back, the question was, do we see these things in isolation? And I would say it's really rare. You know, the body is so complex and interconnected that usually any one given diagnosis that you're treating, you probably need to go ahead and treat the whole neurokinetic chain at some point. And so you can you can automatically assume that there's two or three or four different things that you're going to need to include in your treatment whether it's proximal or distal or, um, you know, neural tension. And, and, and we're just talking about like the immediate problem, get the symptoms better and stuff like that. And then sometimes we have to go beyond that and figure out what is the patient doing that's driving the problem or keeping the problem around. Maybe they sleep with one leg up. Maybe they like to sit with one leg up in the chair. Um, maybe they, you know, sit at their desk a certain way or whatever the case may be. Sometimes there's things that the patient's doing that's keeping the problem around um, or contributing to the problem. So it's, it's, it's very complex. That's so on one hand, it's very simple, you guys on, but on another hand, it's very complex. <clears throat> yep. So the, the, so another, another way to look at it is, for example, I, I have a patient who has I check the extension. The patient has extension being 40 degrees. Wrist extension. There is no scaphoid unit mobility. Patient is doing activities with limited wrist extension. Think about how it will change the mechanics of your superior radial inner joint. Over the period of time, if you have a sitting dysfunction here, it will impact the superior radial inner joint because your body tends to compensate. You still have to function. If you don't have extension here, you'll try to find or you're trying to compensate maybe at the elbow, maybe at your superior radial nerve joint. Now you're compensating at superior radial nerve joint, how it will impact the neurovascular tissue around it, okay? And how it will impact the humeral translation. If your humeral me mechanics is altered here, it will affect the cervical thoracic mechanics. It might affect the pectoralis minor. It might affect the C5, C6. So the short answer is, usually you will find some sort of dysfunction along the chain. Maybe it's severe hair, mild hair, or in certain patients, it's severe hair, mild hair. Maybe the extension is 60 degrees, not 40. Okay. Maybe you have one or two pain hair, or maybe in certain patients, you have more severity hair, six or seven pain. As soon as, as you touch C5, C6, they just jump. I said, I didn't know I had so much pain there because I'm so focused on my elbow. Okay. So the idea is we have to treat along the neurokinetic chain where Dr. Steve was saying, treat along the neurokinetic chain, treat the, all the possible dysfunctions. And I always say this because I would have patients who would go to different clinics and I would see patients from different clinics. 
The point is that if you don't address all dysfunctions in one or two sessions, usually symptoms just reoccur. Okay. If you treat the pelvis and a patient has a secondary thracolumbar dysfunction and you don't treat the thracolumbar, you just treat the pelvis, patient feels good, goes home, does his normal activity, comes back, same dysfunction. Okay. So the idea is treat along the neuro neurokinetic chain, treat along, treat, understand the region interdependence, treat the cervical thoracic spine, treat C5, C6. And you will find patients who have all these possible things if they have more, more because the problem with tennis elbow or lateral elbow pain is it's recurrent. You have one episode, it's not addressed properly, comes back with vengeance, it comes back more with more severity. You'll have a second episode. Every time a tennis elbow patient comes in or patient with lateral elbow pain comes in and you ask them, is this your first episode? Say, no, I had like three previous episodes because the first two episodes were not addressed properly. And this degenerative process, this process of disrepair, this process of irritated neurovascular tissue is going on. They might got some help from a from an anti-inflammatory a little bit and they have some treatment that that put like not reverse that process, but probably put brakes on that process. And then symptoms just keep coming back. So the idea here is treat all these dysfunctions and assess first assess for all these dysfunctions. Okay. Okay. So I'm not trying to be very promotional, but I think we are coming to India and we are, me and Dr. Steve will be in Bombay from 1st to 7th of October. And in, in Delhi from 9 to 15, if you guys will be focusing primarily on six topics, we will be talking about foundations and we'll be talking about Kareem Khan's stuff, Shirley Sarman's stuff in our foundations lecture. It's like day one. And then we're teaching cervical, start, starting with thoracic, cervical, lumbar, and pelvis in that order. Yeah. Okay? And then we'll finish with dry needling. Okay. <clears throat> so the idea is, we believe, and I think Dr. Steve will agree with me, we believe that you don't, if you don't understand the whole chain, you don't understand anything. Yeah. Some people just would come for like one lecture or yeah. come for dry needling. That's fine with us. But I mean, to, to be able to treat patients, you have to be able to treat every segment efficiently. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have a question coming. Okay. Uh, for fees, I think you should reach out to Dr. Dhrumi. She's handling that. I think I have a question. I have a patient with C5, C6, C6, C7 dysfunction, also lateral feels pain. When I perform process, what should be the best sleeping position? Okay. So I can question. So uh, I think we encourage good cervical posture when they're sleeping. I mean, the idea is that if they're sleeping on the side, that should not be causing any closing dysfunction or causing the spine to be in a certain position for the extended period of time. So the idea is they should be able to maintain a good neutral position, neutral position while they're sleeping. Any any thoughts on that, Dr. Steve? Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you what I usually tell my patients when it comes to sleeping, because if you're dealing with uh, neck pain, headaches, or ridiculous symptoms, radiating symptoms from the neck, the neck, be, the neck position becomes really important. So the first thing you have to do is as a therapist, you need to mobilize cervical thoracic junction and you need to address the problem, right? So the PT needs to take care of the joint dysfunction, the soft tissue dysfunction and stuff like that. Then after that, you know, maybe we'll do some heat, some exercises, deep neck flexor training. That's cool. But when it comes to sleeping, then now that I've done alleviated the problem and we've started that journey it might take a few sessions or whatever the case may be but um i will tell my patients look when you sleep you have to recognize that there are certain positions of the head and neck that compress the joints that can open or close the spaces in the neck where the nerves come out and there's positions of the head and neck that can also put tension on or take tension off of the neurovascular bundle that runs down your arm, okay? So basically when you sleep, your head needs to be in line with your body. It needs to be in a neutral position, but that's actually a little bit hard because why? 
because the amount of pillow you need if you're sleeping on your back might be this much pillow. What happens when you roll over onto your side for people that have like broad shoulders, okay? A pillow that's down here is not enough pillow. And so for a lot of people, um, the amount of pillow you need when you're sleeping on your back is not as much as what you need um, when you're sleeping on your side. So when you're sleeping on your back, the head should be in a neutral position. It should be maybe like a little bit flexed. If you flex too much, that, that puts tension on the spinal cord and it's not a great position for your neck. You're placing a lot of tissues on stretch and it's just a matter of time before those tissues, discs, ligaments, um, facets, muscles, whatever. It's just a matter of time before those tissues get unhappy. So if you're flexed too much, that's bad. I've also seen special pillows, special pillows that's like a cradle for the neck and it causes you to sleep like this. Right. And the idea is that it's creating TJ. <laughs> Dr. Singh is like, <laughs> it's painful to see these kinds of things on TV and magazines. Right. It's so hard, so painful, but it's like a cradle for the neck and it causes you to sleep like this. And so on one hand, the idea is that it creates kind of like a decompression or a traction effect for the neck. Granted, if you cock your head back like that and gravity's pulling on your head, yes, it could potentially create that. But the other thing that it creates you guys know when you extend your neck is that it's closing down the neural foramen and it's also compressing the facet joints. And so it is this, it is the most ridiculous position you can put a neck in. Um, the only one that's worse than that is when somebody sleeps on their stomach, head turned to one side and head cocked back like that. We have a name for that. That's called a spurling test. And that's what we do when we're testing for cervical radiculopathy. And so if you put a patient in that position for long enough, what do you think is going to happen on the side they're rotated towards and compressing down the neural foramen are closed and they're going to have symptoms. Um, so when you're sleeping on your back, the head should be neutral, maybe a little bit flexed when you're sleeping on your side, this is, this is not enough pillow. Okay. We're closing down the neural foramen and the facets on this side. And on this side, we're actually creating neural tension because we're side bending away. Okay. So it's, so it's a problem on either side. So this is not enough pillow. This is too much pillow, right? For obvious reasons, we're creating neural tension here. As soon as you side bend away, we're creating neural tension. We are tensioning up the scalenes, elevating first rib, and that's part of the thoracic outlet. So the head needs to be in this position when you're sleeping on your side. Um, what else can I say? Um, I think there was something else that I wanted to say about all that, but I, it, it escapes me. Oh, quick story. Um, so I purchased when I became a new PT and I started making money, I said, right, I've made it. I'm going to go buy myself a nice pillow. So I went down to jolly old Ikea and I bought myself a $60 Ikea pillow and it was like goose down. Right. So it's like cooling and like super comfy and fluffy feathers, whatever. And feels so nice. You just want to rub it on your face. It feels so good. And um, I slept on it the first night. And when I went to sleep, the pillow was like the perfect thickness. It was perfect. And it was so nice. But then after like 30, 45 minutes, this pillow compresses down into nothing because it's goose down. So it like compressed down into nothing. So I actually woke up on my back with numbness and tingling in both my arms and hands. And fortunately, as a physiotherapist, I knew that I was not having a heart attack. I, I knew right away that it was this damn pillow that I bought for $60. So I went back to my five US dollar pillow from Walmart. <laughs> and I gave my $60 pillow to my eldest son, Joshua. <laughs> and he still sleeps with it too today. <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, pillows, how you sleep, it does. It matters a lot. It matters a lot. I'm glad you brought up the question. Well, thank you for the question. So, <clears throat> so treatment of lateral elbow pain, we're going to talk about just some manual therapy techniques and we've recorded some videos. We're going to demonstrate those videos. The idea is treat the whole chain, okay? So I was talking about this piece of evidence 
and I'll turn down the volume because I think you'll see the, you'll hear the music in the background. So the indication is you patient, your 50% of range of motion comes from proximal and distal row of corpus. Patient comes in, lateral elbow pain, does not have extension. Scape, just scape, scaphoid unit palpation is painful. You do the segmental mobility, you find that patient does not have extension, basically 40 degree, 50 degree. Ideally, if you lose 50% of extension, you definitely know your scaphoid unit joint is not moving. All you, all you have to do is put thumb over thumb on the scaphoid unit and then just do this. And you're doing a, you've done, used this technique, Dr. Steve? Yes. Yep. Yep. All my friends who are hand therapists, occupational therapists, please mobilize the joints because <laughs> just because I see occupational therapists treating a lot of wrist, I mean, wrist problems, elbow problems, and they don't improve the joint mobility. That is a problem. Make sure that you're addressing the scapula unit joint. It is usually, it usually causes a lot of problems. There has been research which talks about role of scaphoid mobilization and scaphoid PAs with carpal, carpal tunnel syndrome. So this is a very handy technique. When we're gonna talk about our upper quarter course, we're gonna talk about these conditions and these techniques in greater detail, yeah. Yeah, radial head manipulation. I was, we were talking about the mechanism where your radial head moves dorsolaterally, okay? And it can cause supinator hypertonicity. It can cause entrapment of the radial posterior interosseous neurovascular complex. Make sure that you treat the radial head, okay? And you can always check like supination. All you have to do is just check supination and pronation from side to side. I mean, I'm sure you know goniometry, right? You can just check how much, how much supination is here, and pronation is here, and check, compare it to the opposite side. If one side is less, you know there is a biomechanical fault. You don't even have to assess like segmental mobility. All you have to do is compare side to side comparison of physiological range of motion, supination, pronation. If it is restricted, please manipulate the radio, well, this radial head. Very simple technique, your patient is standing. And you all you're doing is, you're trying to just do a quick thrust on the radial head, okay? That looks really quick and easy, but when you get the radial head to cavitate, to pop, it is, it's usually so loud. I don't know why the radial head is like that, but it's one of the louder, you uh, it's yeah. one of the louder joints that we pop. And I'm just gonna, throw this out here like right now um on like so i'm on social media like facebook instagram and stuff like that and i see a lot of advertisements for like kairos and pts in india and i see them doing manipulations but as someone who does manipulations when i watch those videos i'm like that's not number one he didn't do it right Number two, I promise you there was not a cavitation because the technique was so bad. He was too slow. His hand position was wrong. He didn't do the technique fast enough or or hard enough. Um, and so, like, I don't know. Like, manual therapy, uh, some techniques might be kind of easy or whatever, like, but a lot of techniques are actually really difficult and, and the psychomotor skills required and the repetition required to learn these and get good at these, it's crazy because it takes quite a while. It takes quite a while. Um, I think that Dr. Singh and I are are really good teachers. I think I think that stuff will make a lot of sense. We can give you guys really good feedback, hand position, correct technique, and stuff like that. And then also bring in the um, you know the clinical reasoning piece, you know, which is let us talk about you know case studies, and we'll we'll show we'll take a patient like a lateral elbow pain patient. And we'll, and we'll just show you in five minutes, the manipulations, boom, 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 boom. This is what you should do. And in, in three to five minutes, this is what needs to happen for the patient to feel better. This is what we're going to teach you guys. And then make sure that you guys are proficient. I think we're both really cool. I think we like to have people do techniques on us. We like to do techniques on our students so that you guys can feel what it feels like. And also we can feel how you guys are doing so we can give you the best feedback 
we love doing the hands-on. It's super fun. Um, even, you know, whether it's nine to four or nine to five, like however long we go for, like, it's just, you don't get tired. Like it's, it's so fun. It's so interesting. And this is the kind of stuff that can really make a big impact in, in, in your career as a physiotherapist. Maybe you decide to open up your own clinic one day. Maybe you're working for somebody and you're trying to grow the reputation of that clinic. Um, maybe you want to work with, you know, actors or athletes or a special population. You know, what we provide is an opportunity to become a better therapist, to distinguish yourself in your community. Because when you give good physical therapy, like patients are going to talk about it. You're going to, you're going to get a reputation, you know, your business will grow. You'll get so busy that now you'll have to start, you can start charging more because you don't have enough time in the day to see all the patients that want to see you. So you can start charging a little bit more and become a little bit more of like a niche market, like a niche physiotherapist and stuff like that. So I don't know, guys, for me, the stuff that we teach is, is stuff that causes me to enjoy what I do more, just having a greater understanding and actually effectively treating patients and, and having a skill set that a lot of PTs don't have and patients see that and other PTs see that. Um, you know, for, for, for me personally, my reasoning was just because if I'm going to be a physiotherapist, like I want to be the best one that I can, but in the pursuit of learning and, and, and stuff like that, you know, one of the byproducts has been, you know, the chance to move into leadership, the chance to start my own business, the chance to, you know, have patients every week. I have three, four five patients that are calling me that are trying to see me you know, and stuff like that. So I don't know, it's, it's really cool. Um, I hope you guys will, I hope you guys will consider joining us in either Delhi or Mumbai. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's talk about, this is something called as Mills maneuver. So uh, a little bit about this technique. You don't use this technique on an acute or a subacute tennis elbow patient. You use it on a chronic patient who has, who has, you feel like you have a lot of fibrosis. When you are talking about stages of healing, you have a patient who has a lot of fibrosis. You think the tissue has been scarred down. And so this is a kind of a soft tissue manipulation rather than a joint manipulation. And you're trying to break down that scar tissue. So patient is standing, you're behind the patient, you're trying to... The biggest indicator to do this technique is the patient is not able to extend the elbow because it, they're feeling the restriction. The soft tissue, true soft tissue restriction, secondary to fibrosis. So you don't extend, you don't manipulate an extension, you manipulate in slight flexion where they're not able to gain the range. So this is how the technique looks like. Okay, and you're just trying to do a little, and this is a kind of a very typical technique because the patient I'm doing it on does not, he, he didn't need it, but you will find patients where they need it. And you'll find patients where they have three or four or five previous episodes of tennis elbow. And you're able, anything you do will improve them, but you're still not able to gain the complete extension. And then this technique jumps, you, you use this technique, you flex the, flex the wrist completely, and you're trying to manipulate that scar down fibrotic tissue, okay? And then, the good old mid thoracic manipulation. You have a patient who has a lot of kyphosis and a lot of kyphosis, rest segmental restriction in upper thoracic, mid thoracic spine can also be a precipitator of C5, C6 dysfunction. We talk, we spoke about how C5, C6 dysfunction can, C5, C6 dysfunction can cause symptoms in the elbow, but what is causing C5, C6 dysfunction? Maybe a loss of extension in upper thoracic spine, okay? And so this is a technique patient and it's just going to flex down to the segment. We're going to talk about this technique a lot when we were teaching in India and just, you just manipulate very straightforward, but this looks very simple, but when you start doing it, we'll be in our course, we'll be talking about how you can, how you can break it down into four or five steps, how you can feel it. And so that your force goes straight down. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a third rib MET, fourth rib MET. Okay. You stand behind the patient, you palpate the rib angle. And we do this technique because I, I, I told you how your musculocutaneous and lateral cord can get entrapped with third and fourth rib dysfunction. And sometimes we are not able to manipulate. So we do the MET 
and you're behind, you're pushing the rib angle and patient is resisting. Yeah, and we'll be talking about this technique in thoracic, out of thoracic course. Very important handy technique. You're just doing is pushing, patient is pushing on the sternum, you're pushing on the rib angle and you're trying to push the rib forward. Yeah. And then you can do a manipulation also. If you can do MET and you can do a manipulation. I can actually do it with one hand. I call it an Indian technique. I think I've done it on Dr. Steve one time, if you remember. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So I can do it with one hand, but what you do is you stabilize the contralateral transverse process. But more, I mean, I've, I've done this so many times that I can do it with one hand and get really good results with it. Yeah. Looks like a little ninja technique. And then you have C5, C6. So in my experience, a patient has tonic elbow pain, eventually you'll you'll be using all these techniques in one patient. And that's just my experience. Dr. Steve can disagree. May not be Mills maneuver because Mills maneuver, I think very few patients have like loss of extension restriction. Okay. And but I mean, you can you, you can find like a C5, C6 problem and a scaphoid unit problem and a radial head problem and upper thoracic problem and all or most of your pain, most of your lateral elbow pain patients. So, okay, so this is a, another one you can do like extend side glide. You can do like a little extension side glide and very easy, straightforward technique. Yeah. And then you can do a cervical thoracic extension. And I think we've seen this, all of us do this, pick up the patient. Yeah, not a very, not a very graceful technique, but you do it, you manipulate in posterior superior direction. I like the supine technique better because it's less aggressive. If the patient has shoulder pain, I think this is not a very, very good technique. What do you think about Dr. Steve about this technique? So I used to do this technique a lot um, when I was a newer PT um, mm -hmm. because I was not good at the prone or the supine cervicothoracic junction manipulation. Um, so it's a, it's a great technique. Uh, how often do I use this technique today? Probably not even like once a month. I really prefer to do Thank CT you. junction. I prefer to do CT junction and supine. I can use my body as leverage. Mm -hmm. um, this technique, there's no problem with it. And used to, I was like, Oh, I'm a big, strong guy. Like I love doing this technique. And I would even do it on like really big people, like really like ridiculously big people to where I was like, it was like a gym going to the gym and doing leg day. Okay. <laughs> and I was just very proud of how strong I was. But the reality is that one of the things that is important for manual therapists is sustainability and not injuring ourselves. And so I, this is a great technique, but if you do it all day, every day, um, you know, you might end up hurting yourself. And so for mostly for that reason, but also too, it does require like a lot of physical contact and not all your patients may be comfortable with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a great technique. It's a great technique. I I've used it a ton, a ton over the years. We'll be talking about this in our thoracic course, but we're talking about other alternate ideas, which I think Dr. Steve and me both like just because, okay. And then you have neural mobilizations. You can do a radial flossing, okay. And if you have a posterior interosseous nerve involvement or a radial involvement, you can definitely try this technique. And then we're gonna have like a couple of case studies for you guys, just seeing whether you're paying attention or not, okay. Okay. So the patient is a 41 year old presented with pain in the lateral elbow for past two months. The patient is a computer programmer reported their symptoms started suddenly. Physical findings showed no pain with resisted wrist extension or finger extension. Patient showed some distenderness distal to the radial head, showed no symptoms of numbness and tingling. Segmental mobility testing showed some hypomobility of the radial head, mild pain with resisted supination. Okay, cervical thoracic assessment was negative. What structure was responsible for patient symptoms? Anybody?
what structure do you think is causing patient has no numbness tingling see how many of you can get this people who are in the master class you're right about there but i'm talking about the structure you're talking about i'm talking about the structure okay second I, all of us know that there is a radial head, radial head displacement, but do you think that is causing the pain? And the, the tenderness is distal to the radial head, if you see. Lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm, it's a cutaneous nerve, so it should give you numbness tingling. There is no numbness tingling here. Yes, I think one of you... So the answer, correct answer is posterior interosseous nerve. Patient is... This is where you palpate the PIN. You find the radial head and you go a little distal and interior and you will hit the PIN. And that's where patient has symptoms. So this is tender. And that's why these demarcations are important. Patient is not reporting any numbness and tingling. So it has to be a motor nerve. It can't be radial or lateral cutaneous nerve, right? So it's a posterior interosseous nerve entrapment under supinator muscle that is giving this patient pain. If you keep doing resisted wrist extension, this patient is never getting better, okay? So that's important. So understanding what structures are causing pain is very important. It's a motor, motor nerve issue, okay? PIN palpation is painful, treat that, okay? One more questions and then we'll probably stop for the day. Okay. Patient is a 38 year old female presented with pain in the anterior lateral elbow. Interlateral lateral elbow, not lateral elbow. Interlateral lateral elbow with symptoms of numbness and tingling for the past one patient. The housewife reported that symptoms have been present for a while but became worse recently, which is very common. Sudden onset, some changes, some mood changes, some stress, some changes in physical activity. Physical findings showed minimal pain with wrist extension or finger extension. This is not painful, which is a typical tennis elbow, tendinitis, which you like to call it, or tendinosis. Patient reported pain with cervical thoracic extension, pain with this, tenderness on palpation on the third and fourth rib. So you palpate in third and fourth rib, patient presents with pain in the elbow. Segmental mobility testing showed hypermobility of C5, C6, and C7, T3. Shoulder assessment showed restriction in internal rotation and anterior humeral translation. What structure is causing patient's prop symptoms? You have numbness and tingling, so it has to be a nerve. Okay. What nerve supplies the interlateral elbow? It's not radial nerve. Radial nerve does not supply interlateral, it supplies the posterior lateral. And I see this all the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm. That's the correct answer. It's a branch of musculocutaneous. Musculocutaneous is a branch of lateral meat. Lateral cord of brachial plexus that is getting entrapped at third and fourth rib underneath the pectoralis minor muscle. Okay. So you will only understand this level of complexity if you can assess accurately, segmentally, and understand the neurokinetic chain, which Dr. Steve was telling us. Okay. Okay. Well, good job, guys. Any any questions you guys have? You treat the entire chain. That's the that's that's the mantra from this lecture. Any closing comments you have, Dr. Steve? No, other than um I'm gonna go back to our yep. Other than uh you know, for those of you guys that have already signed up, we look forward to seeing you guys. It's going to be a lot of fun. 
Um, probably there'll be, you know, we'll, we'll get into things and, and talk about things and, and show manipulations and techniques and talk about case studies that aren't even on the agenda. Um, the, you know, the lectures that we do online, because it's primarily online, it's, it's, it's very, it's very information based and it's also very, I would say intellectual and it, and it has to be like, you guys have to understand the intricacies, the anatomy, the physiology, the research, the evidence. Okay. That's that stuff. That stuff is foundational when it comes to the hands-on um, you know, we kind of might review and skim over, you know, some of the head knowledge stuff, but because our, our time with our time there is limited and precious. And so we want to spend as much time as possible doing hands-on stuff, letting you guys get your feet wet. And, and in any given class, we have people who are, you know, pretty good with